My name is Becky Pritchard. I am the children's director here at First Pres, and I'm so blessed to be able to share the message with you today. Our passage comes from the book of Romans, again, yes, we're still in Romans, chapter 11, verses 11 through 16. We're making our way through. I encourage you to follow along in your own Bibles or look up to the screens as I read this passage aloud. And again, it's Romans 11, verses 11 through 16. Hear the word of the Lord. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will, the, will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you, Gentiles, and as much then as, I'm, as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we come to you now and we ask that you fill this place with your Holy Spirit as we know you've come before us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So sometimes I have been called clumsy. Clumsy. I am clumsy. I'm not just been called clumsy. I don't know what to do with all these limbs. I guess it's because I'm almost six foot tall that I'm like tripping over stuff all the time, knocking things over. And I don't know about you, but have you ever been walking, let's say like in a parking lot, and you're going to your car, and all of a sudden you stumble a little bit, and you catch yourself, your heart is beating extra fast, your face gets flushed, you look around and you're like, oh, I hope nobody saw that. But ultimately, you're so, so glad that you didn't actually fall down on the ground, right? Like, phew, I saved myself. So we've all done that, right? But what happens when you actually fall on the ground? I mean, it doesn't happen very much as adults. We see little kids all the time falling down and picking themselves back up. But seriously, as an adult, have you had an experience where you have tripped and fallen on your face? Stuff goes everywhere. You're... It's unrecoverable. There's no way to stay upright at all. You're done, toast, on the ground. People are laughing at you, as they should, because it's pretty funny. Um, <clears throat> but seriously, there's quite a difference between a quick trip and stumble and actually falling down, right? It's over. When you fall down, it's over. Like, you're done, can't recover, might as well just hide in a hole, forget about it. <clears throat> So Paul begins the passage we're talking about today talking about a question. He always does these questions. He asks himself a question as if he's asking the church that he's writing to. And he says, did they, meaning the Israelites, did they stumble in order that they might fall? What he's asking here is if their rejection, if the Israelites' rejection of God that we read about in chapter 10, we've read about it in the first 10 verses of chapter 11, if that means total doom and destruction for the Israelites, like no more salvation, you're doomed, you're, just, you're forever and ever. Or, Paul's asking, is there a chance for recovery? Is this just a quick stumble and, okay, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Or is this a fall flat on your face, you're done, you're out, unrecoverable? I always like to think of downhill skiing. It's one of my favorite events to watch in the Winter Olympics. And you have these professional skiers, and they're skiing down the mountain, and it's steep and it's slippery, and they're going at, like, incredible speeds. As they turn each little curve of the race, sometimes they sort of slip on a turn, and you think they're going to lose it, but they don't. They maintain, and they hit it, and they might win the race. But if they do fall when turning a corner... They're out. They are disqualified. They cannot win the race. They can't even place. They can't even come in last because they're disqualified. So Paul is asking, had the Israelites 
totally fallen out of God's mercy? Were they disqualified from salvation? Or was there still hope? And of course, as Paul usually does when he asks a question in Scripture like this, he often responds to his own question. So he says, immediately, he answers his question. He says, by no means. Absolutely not. Did they stumble in order that they might fall? No. There is still hope. This stumbling insinuates that the Israelites can continue to make progress. Not all is finished. They're not disqualified. And this comes as a shock to us because we've been reading week after week about how Israel's heart is hardened and how God did this and why would he do this? And so now why are we now saying, wait, there's still hope? We've just read about all this hardening and destruction. They're not actually doomed. What we need to remember, and we've talked about this a lot throughout Romans, is how big God is. This doesn't make sense to us because we are human and God is God. And God is so God that he had a plan from the very beginning. God has unfathomable love and mercy. Unfathomable. He doesn't pick up a flower and play the game, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not, ending up with the stem, he loves me not, sorry, oops. God doesn't play that game. God is faithful even when we are not faithful. I've said this in pretty much every sermon I've preached in Romans so far. So you think I'm a broken record, but seriously, Paul is a broken record. God is faithful even when we are not faithful. Even though the Israelites, the chosen people, remember, the Israelites were the chosen race. God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the entire race would be the chosen race. And even they turned away from God. God remained faithful, of course, and they were not doomed forever. They weren't disqualified. So then, if they're not disqualified, what then is the reason for the stumbling? Is it just to make them look silly? Is it just so that God can exert his power and say, I'm in charge, you're not? Or is there a plan? Is there something bigger than what we even know as humans? What we know as what we read on is that God's plan is being revealed. It's being unveiled bit by bit as he walks through this. So Paul goes on to explain that because of Israel's trespass, which means they're stumbling, which means they're turning away from God, the Gentiles now have salvation. Now, I want you to remember If you know anything about Israelites and Gentiles, you know that they are not the same. Israelites were the chosen race. They were the ones born into the lineage of chosenness. The Gentiles were not. They were the outsiders. The Gentiles are now offered salvation because Israel said no. There is a reason for God's hardening of the Israelites' hearts. It still doesn't make sense. Why would God harden the hearts of the chosen ones in order to allow the riffraff, the Gentiles, to become saved? Why do the Gentiles get a chance at salvation? Why do any of us get a chance at salvation? God had a plan. From the very beginning, God had a plan. And although it included hardening, which makes us confused and not understand why God would do that. It also included grace. It also included mercy. I mean, we can sit here and ask the same questions about why God would send Jesus to die a horrible death on the cross. Why would he do it like that? So awfully, so horribly, so graphically. It was a plan for our salvation. God is God. God is big. God did the hardening, but there was so much more planned. And he was guiding history so that the Gentiles could receive salvation. The Gentiles. I mean, the Gentiles. It's hard to know, and it's hard to to understand how big this is. But seriously, the Gentiles could receive salvation. 
But as we see here, it's not just the Gentiles. There still is hope for the Israelites, as Paul is saying. We see he's, he's pointing to the fact that Israel is not completely fallen, and there, there might be a chance here. And now that the Gentiles do have the opportunity to receive salvation, guess what? Israelites are going to be jealous because they're going to look at the Gentiles' lives, and they're going to say, wow, what is going on with their lives that is so appealing? And I want that. Paul is trying to make the Israelites jealous by focusing on his ministry to the Gentiles. Paul is a Jew that has been converted to follow Christ. Paul knows his people. His ministry is to the Gentiles, but he's thinking, okay, there's a way to get these Israelites in. Jealousy. Jealousy is often not a good thing. We're not... supposed to be jealous, right? But Paul is meaning this for good. The jealousy of seeing others inherit what was meant for them in the first place, man, that's big. It's like the the promise was meant for you, Israelites. You were the chosen people. You got the promise, but you turned it down. Someone else got it because you didn't want it. That's big. So it kind of reminds me of, let's say you've got two kids, and you have child A and child B, we'll call them, and you offer child A a loaf of bread. Hey, child A, would you like this loaf of bread? And the child's like, no, thanks. So you're like, okay, child B, would you like the loaf of bread? And child B says, sure, I'd love the loaf of bread. And starts to eat it and so happy, so full. And now what does child A do? What? I want that bread. Well, you had your chance. You were offered it first, but you turned it down. Now they're jealous of child B, right? Happens all the time. Or imagine it like this. Let's say Julia Roberts, a famous actress, is offered the leading role in the next big movie. She turns it down. She doesn't think it's going to make any money. She's like, Psh. Forget that. That's going to be a tanker. So the director turns to Meg Ryan, another famous actress, and says, it's yours if you want it. So Meg's like, sure, I'm I'm on it. I'll do it. And guess what? The movie's a hit. It goes viral. It's a blockbuster, millions and millions of dollars. And Julia Roberts is going, that was meant for me. I got the choice to pick it first, and I turned it down. I can't believe it. When you turn something down and someone else gets to enjoy it, how much more likely are you to seek out what they have? You were offered it first. And this is exactly what Paul wanted to happen with the Israelites. He wanted the Israelites to look and see the joy and peace that the Gentiles have now that they have salvation, now that they are in Christ. They are enjoying the relationship with the Father that was intended for the Israelites, the chosen ones. It's as if God said to the Jewish people, all right, I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you Jesus. I'm going to give you the prophets. I'm going to give you the Old Testament. And you're going to have the first opportunity for salvation. And what did they say? Just don't want it. So God said, all right, if you don't want it, I'm going to take the message of my love. I'm going to give it to somebody who does want it. If you won't listen, I will give it to somebody who will listen. If you won't pay attention, I'll give it to somebody who will. Isn't this just like the story that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 14 about a rich man who invited his friends to a banquet? And as invitations went out, one by one, the excuses came tumbling in about how people could not go. Well, I'm getting married, or I just bought a field, or I just bought five new oxen, and I just couldn't possibly make it to the banquet. So what did the rich man do? He went out and he invited the crippled and the poor and the lame. He filled the table He did not want a seat left empty. 
And he said that none of those who were originally invited would get to enjoy the banquet because they said no. But look how many more spots were open for all the rest. This just ties in with our passage in Romans today. The Jewish chosen people rejected this. So the riffraff, the Gentiles, the, the excluded ones, the people who don't really belong, they were invited to the table. God said, I want my table filled up. Table wasn't set for the Gentiles. The place cards were not set for them in the beginning. But when the people of Israel said no, the room opened up. And for us, too. And we've been eating at the table ever since. As you see, we have another table here today. And today we'll be taking communion together. When we take communion, we reflect on this great image of the banquet table. The riffraff, you and me, are invited to the banquet table. We've invited not because of the great and wonderful things we've done. No, no. We've not been invited because of the horrible things we've done. We've not been invited because of who our parents are or what our race is. No, we've been invited because of God's grace and mercy, because of what Christ did on the cross. This table is open for you because God wants to use your life to make Jesus beautiful and visible to people that don't know Jesus so that your unbelieving friends will look at you and become thirsty for the water of life and become hungry for the bread of life so that they'll look at you and be jealous of what you have in Christ. In a few weeks, we'll be looking at Romans 12, and I have to jump ahead just because this passage is so great. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, I'll be reading this from the message. It says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, and you will be changed from the inside out. Do you make people thirsty for Jesus? Does your life make anyone hungry to know the Lord? Do you exhibit such joy and freedom that people want to know where it comes from? A satisfied customer is always the best advertisement for any product. One person whose life has changed means more than 10 people who talk about it but don't actually reflect the inner reality of it. It's why we see people on Facebook selling face cream and protein shakes because their lives have been changed by the product and they can't help but shout it from the rooftops. They want everyone to sign up. This is how we should be about our lives in Christ. Don't you think? Don't you think we should get excited and smell different because of who Christ is? <sighs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> God took Israel's rejection of Jesus and enriched the world. Not just did the Gentiles have a chance for salvation. The impact ended up being far greater. The world was enriched. The passage says that it ended up sending to the world life from the dead. That's the only time in this entire Bible that we have those words together. Life from the dead. That's huge. So how does the transgressions and failures of the Israelites equal riches? In my life, transgressions and failures equal ruin and horrible results. But this is where God's sovereignty comes in. We have not experienced, have you not experienced God working in the midst of transgressions and failures? In the midst of the stumbles? We would fall a whole lot more if it weren't for God. 
And here Paul is talking about universal riches, and those riches are the gospel, the life-changing work of Jesus Christ. It's truly life-changing. As you saw in that video, that trip was life-changing because of what Christ did. If Israel's stumble allowed the Gentiles to become saved, Paul is asking us to imagine what Israel's fullness might mean. The day is coming when God's plan and purpose for Israel will be completed and perfectly fulfilled. It's coming. If you think it's good now, just wait. Imagine what it's going to be like when the Jewish people in great numbers come to Jesus Christ and bow the knee to him. A worldwide party. God will have all of his children gathered around the table. Gentiles, Jews, poor, crippled, everyone. Just like this communion table. If this table was only open to the Jews, the chosen ones, many of us would be excluded from the table. But thank God for Jesus Christ. God's plan accounted for this. We are all considered holy because of what Christ did for us on the cross. We're all included at the table because of Christ, if we profess him as Lord. So as we prepare to come to the table in a moment, I ask you to be reminded of the amazing gift of Christ, of Christ's sacrifice for your sin. And I hope that The reason for this is that you'll be nurtured here. You'll be reminded of the the body and the blood. You'll be nurtured to then go out and live in a way that makes other people want what you have. Making other people jealous. Living to make Jesus visible. That is our slogan, our mission statement, our whatever it is. And that is so true, and it could not be more true, to live so that those who don't know Jesus can see him clearly through your life. Will you commit today to be part of the restoration of all the people who are apart from Christ? Will you commit to a greater growth and fellowship in Christ today? Tell your friends. Tell your family, tell your coworkers, send a note, pick up the phone, invite them to church, show them you love them. Don't keep your mouth shut. Don't hide it here, but go into the world. Let's get excited about what Jesus has done for us and live in a way that reflects the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. God, we come to you. We're thankful for the love, the grace, and for your son, Jesus Christ. None of us would be included here if it weren't for Christ's sacrifice on the cross. God, as we prepare to feast at your holy table, we ask that you prepare our hearts. Give us strength and wisdom As we leave from here today, glorifying you, in your son's name we pray, amen.